ma, 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 ma. Yes, sir. Let him have his way. Let him have his way. Let him have his way. Yes, sir. Ma, 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 ma. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow down before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. Wow. Praise his name. Gracious God, our Father, we come in your presence this morning and we would ask again that you would receive our worship, our praise, our thanks, our attitude of gratitude that we are nothing without you. You truly are the vine and we are your branches and without you we can do nothing. So we ask that you would, uh, even now, cleanse us, wash us as we confess our sins. We agree with you about what we have done this week, even this morning. Sins of attitude, of not putting you in your proper place of not valuing you, of not treating you as serious and as awesome and as all as you are. Forgive us today in the name of Jesus. Pray God that you would um, just restore our fellowship and I ask for a fresh filling of your spirit that I might think your thoughts and speak your words and Get glory to yourself. That saints might be edified, unbelievers evangelized. Backstabbers or backsliders, Lord, be restored in the name of Jesus. We'll give you glory. We give you glory now. Hallelujah to your name. There is none like you. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Let's give God a hand of praise if you would. There has been this saying, and I'm quite sure you heard it, and there is a ring of truth in it. You are what you eat. The didium goes, if you eat carrots, you're going to be like a carrot. If you eat Big Macs all the time, you're going to be a Big Mac. (laughs) There is some truth to that phrase that we are what we eat and I would even say more so spiritually. We are what we eat. The scriptures remind us that As a man, a woman thinks, so are they. There's a Chinese proverb that says, you sow, I'm sorry, it says you sow a thought, 
You reap a deed. You sow a deed, you'll reap a habit. You sow a habit, you'll reap a character. And you sow a character, you'll reap a destiny. It's crucial and important that we be careful of what we think and what we put in us that causes us to think. This morning I want to do part two of this mindset for ministry. I want to share with you what has been working for me. And trust me, I'm sharing it. Just bury my heart and trying to be truthful and honest and not being crafty or deceitful. Um, if you would, Dr. Lester Taylor said, Lord have mercy. I was just thinking. Just thinking about some things of 42 years of pastoring, 40 years of marriage, and 45 years, 46 years of salvation. Um, I just want to share with you what I believe that has been working, has worked and has been working, and ain't no need in changing now. Because uh, another adage that we say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. What are these things? And I want to say this too, that I, I'm, I'm sharing it with you because I want you to know I'm not that smart to devise or to think about what is it that makes a person stick and stay or what is it that makes a person um, be steadfast in the midst of troubles and trials and tribulation. I, I wish I could be that deep, but I want you to know as your pastor, I'm just not that deep. I don't know what to do when it comes to living this Christian life apart from what the scripture says we ought to do and what we ought to be. So, so let me tell you my thoughts about God's thoughts that was transcribed by Paul's thoughts which was God's thoughts using the Apostle Paul to set for me some solid, sure, tried and trusted biblical principles and truths that I think I know that it has sustained me and hopefully I'm sharing it so that if you haven't taken it under consideration, take it under consideration because I believe what he has used for me, he, he wants to use it for you too. So last week we looked at some things and we saw some things and I don't want to go back over those things but since this is part two, go back next week and we're still going to start giving those, uh, you know, getting those D DVDs back out or those uh, flash drives. We're we going to get modernized on doing the service and worship because some of you don't know how to go back on. Some of you want to go back on when you can go back on so you just can put it in and do what you want to do with that ministry. Um, 
turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3 of the book of 2 Timothy. And I'm going to read from chapter 3 verse 14 through chapter 4. Uh, verse to verse 4. All right, I think I can stand up for this too. I think it's a shame y'all make me get convicted. Um, I'm sitting and y'all standing, you know what I mean? What's up, Cree? <laughs> um, you'll find these words there. It's the NIV version of Holy Writ, verse 14. But as for you, continue what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scripture, which are able to make you wise to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed. And it is used for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God, the person of God, the people of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men and women will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will vote pastors in church. I'm sorry, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to save what their itching ears want to hear. You may be seated in the presence of our God. We are what we eat. You can't help it, they go together. Whatever you put in you is going to show through you and come out of you. Here, what Paul does and what I have gotten from what he says, and I've been trying to implement this throughout 42 years. It's a reminder, it's an encouragement, it's a charge, it's, it's just that. And for one to do what one ought to do, he gives me, gives you reasons for nourishing yourself. It's a necessity to nourish yourself. And he gives reasons why he's telling me, you, why we ought to nourish ourselves. By the way, this is 
the last epistle that Paul wrote. This is his swan song epistle. This is his last will, if you would, in testament. This, to me, knowing that shows the seriousness of what Paul has to say to his young son, Timothy. He says, if you would, with Nero's chopping block in mind, you all know the verse in chapter four where he says, the time of my departure is at hand. I'm on my way. I'm going to be like a ship going across the anvils of time into eternity. I'm going to be like a poured out sacrifice in which I've done with my life. I'm going to be like a serious athlete. I'm running, I ran my race, I finished my course. Uh, I'm going to be like a security guard, and I've been like a security guard. I've kept the faith. And now is laid up for me a crown that I'm going to receive from the righteous judge in light of the context, Nero, Nero was not a righteous judge. Those that judged him was going to behead him for the name of Christ and for those religious leaders that charged him with false charges and now he's going to be judged. He says here, I know I'm judged here, but I'm getting ready to be judged by the righteous judge. The one that's going to judge me rightly because he is righteous. It behooves us that in another passage that Paul quoted to one of the churches, he said to them, don't judge, don't be quick to judge stuff before it's time. Because some stuff will come out and you'll see other things will be judged on the other side. But whatever you do, discern what you need to discern because we all are going to be judged. So here Paul says to me and to you too, I'm just telling you my mindset for ministry and that is you need to be nourished and nurtured and you need to be nourished and nurtured and you've got to do this for yourself. In light of this context where Paul tells Timothy pastoring in the city of Ephesus he says to him, you need to use and recognize what you use is the authority of scripture. So what you do and what I do when it comes to this issue of ministry and being in and doing ministry and being called to ministry, for me, it's emphatic, it's clear, it's plain, it's a charge. He says, you build your life on the authority of Scripture. Why do, why should anyone, why should I build my life on the authority of scripture it's because prior to coming to Christ I built my life on the authority of other things other than scripture I stood on certain principles I practiced certain things that did not come from the scripture. For me, it was 
the scripture that Paul says that it's authoritative, meaning if you read with me, it's not just authoritative, but it is that which will continually make you strong. Put character in you that your life will change. So read with me in chapter 3, verse 14. But as for you, talking to Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known, there it is, the Holy Scripture. And that Holy Scripture, which is able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Quickly, if you would, Paul says to me and says to you that the thing that everyone needs to do, and I'm just talking from my mindset, uh, what I need to do is that I need to be nurtured and get nourishment from the scripture. The word of God is that which will bring you to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. My sisters and my brothers, 45 years ago, 46 years ago, the only way that I've came that I came to know Jesus Christ is because of what my pastor said that which is that which was in the scripture I did not know that that was in the scripture until he began to preach what was in the scripture and I found out that the scripture is what God has given unto you and me and if it is efficient and effective and impactful enough to lead me to Jesus Christ why wouldn't I continue in the same scripture that can make others wise as well. It's the scriptures that Paul says to Timothy, he says, hey, listen, you need to stay with, stick with, continue with the holy scriptures. Because It was that which makes you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. He says the scriptures is what makes one wise and leads one to salvation by faith in Christ Jesus. No scripture, no faith. No faith, no belief. No belief, no salvation. It's the scripture that produces and leads faith in the Lord Jesus. Oh, I wish I can stay there for a minute. I'm just going to say we need to get dove into the scripture because of its authority. He says in verse 16, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, 
and training in righteousness. Lord have mercy. And that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture and every good work. My sisters and my brothers, it is so important that you and I and that myself may be nourished by the scripture. Lord have mercy. And what I mean by that, my sisters and my brothers, is that Paul says that the scriptures, here it is, came from God. From God to us. I'm going to say that one more time. This is the reason why I, I, I suppose to and I want to and I desire to to know the scripture because it's from God to me. You understand what I'm saying when I say I'm talking my mindset from ministry. It's from God to me. It is God breathed. Let, let, let me say it this way, my sisters and my brothers. The scent of scripture. It's so fresh from the mouth of God that you can still catch the scent of his breath on these pages. It's God breathed. I mean, I, I don't know if you get it. Um, this is how I get it. This is what it means to me. Um, historically, contextually, we know that Timothy was against a lot of foes that were attacking him in chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. And so Paul reminds him that, you know, 1 through 10 as well, that false teachers and all that kind of stuff was coming and was going to come and was coming and in my context I feel the same way there are so many false teachings that are being taught out here not only outside the church but inside the church and 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 you've got to keep your spiritual head on a swivel and your ears open as radar detectors so that you can fall, so you can sense or detect falsity and fallacy when it comes to the scripture, the word of God. Paul says it's the breath of God from you to me. Yes, I know he used human objects to write it, but it's the breath of God. He says all scripture to Timothy then he was talking about the 39 books of the Old Testament. The New Testament had not been fully written yet, but in 2 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul addresses the New Testament was being written during the time that he was saying what he was saying to Timothy, but he was talking primarily about the Old Testament for Timothy. So in those 39 books, Paul said, Every last one of them, the word, the, the word all really means every. Scripture is God breathed. 
Meaning God did something for you and me, for us, that he did not do through centuries ago. I mean, he, this God that we claim to know, this God has done something that blows my mind and it is amazing on how he did it. It's God breathed. God, as um, some translations say, inspired. This is called the inerrancy of scripture where God has transpired by using human beings to inspire so that they can transcribe what God is saying in human language so that he can relate to you and to me. I, I was reading this illustration of this little girl who was sitting next to her mother in church and uh, she looked over at her mother and she asked her mother, did God really write that? As she, the mother had her Bible open, the mother looked back at the child and whispered, yes, he did. Then she looked back at the Bible and said to the mother that had the Bible open, he sure has nice handwriting. Lord have mercy. My sisters and my brothers, we know that God used human beings to be conduits of what he want what he wanted said and he used their minds and their personalities and he held in check their fallacies because what was coming through them was infallible even those that wrote it were fallible Lord have mercy and you must understand how we come to the conclusion of the infallibility of scripture is because when you look at how it was transcribed that God used human authors to write in their own distinctive handwriting however the unity of the authors were mind-blowing to us that received the scripture because the unity of these authors, some 40 writers on three different continents and three different languages over 1,500 years tell the same story that lived in different times, different places, and point it to the scripture as its divine origin to reveal the one and only one, Jesus Christ. You tell me how can that happen over 1,500 years, three different continents, 40 different authors wrote at different times and all their messages came together with unity and continuity to reveal none other than Jesus Christ. And reveal the mind of God. The humanity of these authors point to the rational purpose of God. And the scriptures point to that and just think about it. God stooped to speak to you and me through people like us in understandable human language so he could establish relationship with us. God, God did this. He, 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 could, he, he, he could have remained above human contact, inscrutable, unreachable, but as Dr. Henry Carl Henry said in one of his books, he said the Bible is God's free and gracious choice to give us his privacy that we may know him in 
the scripture. Can you imagine, my sisters and my brothers, when I read this book, God allows us to get inside his head. He, he allows us to read his mail. He allows us to eavesdrop on his heavenly council chamber. See the world through, he allows us to see the world through his eyes. When you and I get into and let it get in us the scripture, Paul says all things, all scripture, is God breathed. Lord have mercy. His most personal thoughts God allows us to see, to hear him think. He, such, such behind the scene access to the creator of the universe is nothing less than an invitation to know him. He has given you and me, given me the scripture so that this scripture that he's given us is a document of authority. Do, do, do you understand what I'm trying to say? It's so profound to me that I can't even sometimes articulate what I'm sensing. And, and, and that is God has literally through the scripture said to you and me and says to me, this is what I think about you, about the world, about my church, about government, about life, about living. This is what is so profound and I don't ever want to get used to and take for granted this whole issue about the scripture. I mean, the Bible is God's mind, God's words communicating to me as well as to you about who he is, who we are, the way he thinks, and the way he moves in history and in time. He reveals in the scripture who he is in his person, his character, his attributes. He lays it all in the scripture and ultimately when it comes to what Paul told Timothy, these scriptures will make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Dr. Norman Gessler, um, I have many of his books that I received when I was getting my undergrad at Philadelphia College of Bible. He put it this way, when it comes to the Bible was written to reveal Christ. He says, in the law, we find the foundation of Christ. That's the five books of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Are you with me? Deuteronomy. He says, in the books of history, we find the preparation of Christ. In the books of poetry, we find the aspirations of Christ. In the books of the prophets, we find the expectations of Christ. In the gospel, we have the manifestation of Christ. In Acts, we have the propagation of Christ. In the epistles, we find the interpretation and the explanation of of Christ. In Revelation, we find the consummation of Christ, meaning Christ is throughout all of the scripture. And that which is, and he who is 
throughout all of the scripture, we might need to, I might need to delve into so that I can get to know the one that brought me to him through the scripture. I need to get to know him so that he can teach me how to walk his life as he walked in the scripture so that I can know how to do his deeds that he did that's in the scripture so that I can be able to think like he thinks that's in the scripture so that I'll be able to feel like he feels that's in the scripture and I'll be able to do what he does and what he did that's in the scripture. So for me, I can't make it without it. I'm not that smart to think that I know everything and I know how to do everything and I know every decision I make, I'm going to do it off the top part of my head. I am not that smart. I'm smart enough to know not to be dumb enough to not go to the scripture. I know you think I'm trite and trivial. You know, yeah, you're going to talk about the Bible. You're going to think you say about the Bible. I'm sorry. I'm too scared to trust me on some things that I have to do. I don't know some things, but I do know them if I get in the scripture because it's the breath of God. And when I read it, I can smell his scent of his breath. It's the scripture, the word of God. It's inspiring. I think it was Charles Hatton Spurgeon that said, a Bible that has fallen apart usually belongs to someone whose life is not. Y'all maybe have to hashtag that one. I wish I did thought of that, but I read that. I read that somewhere. I think it was a lecture to his students. He said this statement, a Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to someone whose life that is not. Otherwise, we ought to be so much in it. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> That, that there needs to be some wrinkles somewhere. I mean, we ought to be so much in it. And I got so many copies, so I, I the different translations and different Bible study uh, Bibles and all that kind of stuff. But, but there, there's always one or two that I preach out of and that I read from um, on, on a daily basis. And, and, and I, I, got, I was looking down in my, uh, my, in my uh, study in my basement at my house, and I pulled out a Bible. Uh, that has a cover over it, a zipper cover over it, and I opened it up, and it was, uh, when I went to Philadelphia College of Bible, it was the Schofield Study Bible. Then. And it was the Bible that my mama bought me. And she signed her name in it. And I went through that Bible, I had... I had lines going through stuff, straight lines pointing to other stuff, other stuff pointing to the footnotes. I mean, I was going, I went through that Bible as I was going through Philadelphia College of Bible back then. That's what it was called. That was the name of it. And I was just diving into the scripture. I just couldn't get enough of what I was eating and Paul says sometimes we fall off that's why he says to Timothy continue in these things now that would be a, a liar and a hypocrite if I tell you that there have not been times when my devotional life may not have been consistent as it used to be. 
Um, I, 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 I would not be integral if I would say to you, there's never been a day that I've not gotten my devotions in. Um, no, there were some days, and usually it happens when you're going through something. That's the most, excuse me, I'm talking about for me. It's the most stupidest thing that you could ever do is that when you ain't going through nothing, you going through the scripture. But when you start going through something, you put down the scripture and sit there and try to figure it out in your stupidity and in your sanctified stupidity of what's going on, how am I gonna handle this, how am I handle this person. No, that's the time that the Bible says, if you draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. We don't draw from him when we're going through. We need to draw to him so that he can help us get through. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadows of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, walking with me through the valley. I, I, I must confess there have been times when I fell off the wagon, man. Missed devotions for a couple days or so. And, and, and you, you, you know what? I, I know that I have been, uh, I have tasted of the scripture so that after a while, you know, two, three days for me go by and I don't read the scripture I start feeling funny. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, you, you start feeling funny um, about not picking up the scripture. And I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about these little five minute devotions that we do. You check this out. We'll spend hours on our phones and online, but we only gonna spend five, 10 minutes with the Lord. Tell me what kind of sense that makes. <laughs> but, but, but you understand what I'm saying? And we are pit quick to pick up the Bible. I mean, quick, quick to pick up our phones. I mean, the minute we put it down, it's like it's something that just keeps drawing us <laughs> to the phone, man. Imagine, just imagine, somebody shared this with me, um, and I, I'm not going to say this originated from me because it didn't. Someone shared this with me. I think it was one of our deaconess or someone. She, she, she said to me, she said to me, she said that there was a, um, a guy online that did this testing on Christians and how that they spend more time texting, TikToking, Instagramming, then they do picking up the scripture and reading. Now you did oh that's no no think about that. I don't gotta get ready to get out of here. Think, think about that. And I remember uh uh my son said this in one of his messages, he said he had to put a timer on his phone to tell him when to stop scrolling. Now, don't act like he the only one that does that or that, 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 you know, does this scroll thing. If you think about it, if you think about how many times you text back, how many times you check a Facebook, how many times you post on Facebook, how many times you post something on Instagram, how many times you deal with different social media platforms. Think about the minutes and the hours that we do that in a day. And then to culminate that, all right, and let's just say, I'm just going to say, I'm going to say, we do that at least four hours in a day. I'm just going to, I'm use that as an arbitrary number. No, I ain't on there that long. Watch. Watch what you do. Look how you do it. You might not be four hours straight, 
but you'll do an hour here, 15 minutes here, 20 minutes here, another hour here, another 40 minutes, another 30 minutes. And, and I'm just saying, you know, I, I'm being, I'm being, being real, I'm low balling this thing about four hours in a day. Now imagine if you would pick up your word as many times as you pick up a text to give back a text, open up the word and watch God give you a text. That's God texting you and me and saying to you and me, respond. Lord have mercy. That's why it's important to, to nurture ourselves in the scripture. Preachers, teachers, how much time do you really spend in the scriptures? And I'm not talking about you got to be all deep. I got to get five hours in so I wake up at five in the morning before I leave out so I can just read the scripture for a couple hours. Okay, great. God bless you. God. But how about this? How about get up maybe a half an hour before you normally get up? And just, if you get, get a plan that you can read through the scriptures. Or get a devotional that you can, takes you through the scriptures. I mean, you know, just do something that makes you spend more time in the scripture, not just reading, but meditating. Now, how about getting out of it, sitting back, and think about, mull over in your head, what you just read. Because you'll mull over other stuff longer. You'll take foolish stuff like Satan will give you thoughts. And you'll sit there and the thought will just come to your mind and you and I think it's our thought. And we'll start thinking about that thing. Man. Wow. Ooh. Wow. Mm, 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 mm. Is that what they really meant? Is that what they really say? Oh, girl, let me stop. Let me stop, man. Let me stop thinking about that. Then we'll go on to something else. Then I thought I'd drop back in our head. And then we'll think about a little bit more that day. Mull it around. Some of us have even taken bed with us at night. Imagine if you take a passage. Think about it. Have you ever converse with the scripture? What I mean by converse, ask it, que ask it questions. Well, well, Lord, what do you mean by that? Okay, how would I do that? That's mauling, that's meditating. And, and Warren Wiersbe said, if you talk to your Bible, the Bible will talk back to you. Yeah, get in the scriptures. Now, I'm not trying to tell y'all to go home after I get finished. I'm going to set aside one hour every day, and I'm going to read the word of God. You're going to get tired, you're going to get frustrated, and you're going to lose your focus. And you're going to say, I, I can't do that. How about this? This is how I started many, many years ago. 15 minutes of reading a portion of scripture. Writing down, excuse me, what I believe it means. Write down what do I need to change and write down what command am I supposed to obey in this passage of scripture. Then it got so good, and actually I was in school, so I, I would go to the library and just read. And what's so cool and dope about us being in this age, in this day, you can have the Bible read to you. 
either while you're reading it or while you're rolling. You can have it read to you. You'll get more time in it being read to you than you would do reading the text and all that other stuff that you and I go through on a day-to-day basis. I'm supposed to nourish myself in Scripture because of the authority of the Scripture. I'll come back week after next because next week Pastor Cofield is going to be here, but I want to say this to you. That if I'm not to be anything else, I can be other things, but it's one thing that I ought to be all the time. And that's a hurler of the scripture, a teacher of the scripture. Paul says, it will give you, according to 2 Timothy, Chapter 3, he says, it is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and it is useful for training in righteousness. So, my sisters and my brothers, the reason why we ought to be in the scriptures is because the scriptures will teach us some things that we don't know, rebuke us about some things that we ought not be doing and that we do know. Y'all not talking back to me. The scripture is also used for correcting us when we err It puts us in the right path, and that word there means with a proper response. So whatever the scripture corrects us from doing, that's the thing we ought not to do, but we ought to do something other than what we were doing. It corrects us. If there's anybody in this house that has never been and people act like this, that when they hear a message or hear a lesson or hear a sermon, it's always for somebody else. Every time they hear the word of God and it corrects them about something in their life or rebukes them sharply about something that they've done or didn't do that they should have done, they always brush it off and they let it go off like water on a duck's back and that's why their lives never change. They always remain the same. They get stuck, stymied, and stifled. If God can never correct you about nothing in your life, you don't need to be living on planet earth. You belong up in heaven. For all of us have some stuff that need to be straightened out. All of us got some stuff that need to be changed. All of us have some stuff in our lives that God needs to anchor it down and hoist it down. God always has something to say to us and what he uses is the scripture. Because it leads us by faith in Jesus Christ. There may be somebody here this morning who 